Hi, I'm Dr. Gemma, and welcome back to Cognitive, the Knitting Psychology Podcast. Cheerfully and somewhat irregularly in business since 2008. Segments today may include what's on my hooks, needles, and spindles, a strategy, something I really like, put a lid on it, oh shoot, and blather. So sit back, put your feet up, pick up your knitting, crocheting, spinning, weaving, or dyeing, (laughs) or any other yarny thing you're doing, and get ready to enjoy. Well, hello there. I'm Dr. Gemma, and this is episode 173 of the Cognitive Podcast. Hooray! I am recording this at 9.07 p.m. on Sunday evening, March 10th, 2024. And as you can see, if you go into the show notes, this was an election week here in the U.S., and I did vote. And I have some interesting discoveries about that, I'm happy to say. Your comments are very welcome, and I certainly enjoyed them this week. You can comment on the blog at cognitivepodcast.blogspot.com or on our group on Ravelry. Let's see what everybody has been saying. Well, warm thanks, first of all, to our own Chris, uh, who was talking about the idea of overthinking, and she said, I think I'm underthinking, and... To me, that is a reference to what here in America we call mommy brain, where you're constantly second guessing small children or your pregnancy or your pregnancy and small children. And it is hard to keep, as the jugglers say, all the balls in the air. But she said sometimes you just get down to what they advocate in the second Frozen movie. That is just do the next right thing. Don't try to sort out every problem. Just figure what's my next step. I could not have said that better myself, Chris, because that's right, that I didn't even go there with this idea of obsessive thinking or thinking too much. But yes, when you obsessively think, and no, this is not mommy brain, when you obsessively think, you have so many things spinning in your head that you actually have to go do the frozen thing. You have to just do the next right thing. And that is the one, shall we say, the least common denominator of both overthinking and underthinking. When you feel like your brain is frozen in underthinking, sorry about that horrible pun on the movie, when you feel like your brain is frozen and you can't think, then you just have to identify what needs to happen next. When you feel like your brain is so full of ideas and they're buzzing around like a hornet's nest in there, you have to just say, what would the right thing to do be? And often when you choose the next right thing, other things tend to fall into a more natural order and your path becomes more obvious. So thank you, Chris. That's absolutely wonderful. And I do think overthinking and underthinking in that respect are somewhat related, but that will just tie all our brains into knots. So I'm going to go on to our friend Jeanette, who is Yo Netty Yo, (laughs) one of the better names that you see online. And I wanted to welcome her. Apparently she was listening and she also liked my strategy when I talked about dopamine addiction. I really thought I'd overdone it and I keep getting all these messages like, wow, hey, that was great. I will say one thing. When you look at obsessive thinking or continually thinking about the bad things in your life, whatever you want to call this, when you look at that thing as I am producing dopamine by trying to solve a problem, when I think about these unhappy memories or these bad situations. And that would be great, except I'm poisoning myself on corticosteroids because these are so painful. So instead of continually trying to talk about, I don't know, my issues with my crazy family growing up and waiting for some magical resolution to appear, which has not appeared in your entire life up to this point, And meanwhile, you're poisoning yourself on corticosteroids, but you are drowning in dopamine. Instead of doing that, you could simply say, there has to be a better way to get dopamine than reliving painful thoughts. And you can substitute a dopamine producing thought or planning or whatever that does not poison you on corticosteroids. And 
people say to me constantly, I think too much, I overthink, how do I get out of it? This is how you get out of it. You do not get out of it by thinking about the same problem endlessly. You may have noticed that, that you do this endlessly and it doesn't solve anything. Yeah, that's you responding to the dopamine addiction. You're not going to get out of it by continuing to think about the same thing. You have to think about something new. That's all. It's distress tolerance. It's thought substitution. Use a thought that gives you dopamine but does not give you corticosteroids. Hello, we're all knitters. Guess what we're all doing? You betcha. There's all sorts of research on knitting, and we know it probably applies to crochet, to playing piano, anything where you use your two hands somewhat out of sync, conducting an orchestra, all these things. What's going on there? You're giving yourself dopamine, and you're creating, and you're involved in a creative process, and the problem solving can end. So I'm going to talk about working on my hex sweater and problem solving on how I want the trim and the edges to look in the finishing. And by doing that, yes, I'm trapped endlessly in this sweater right now, but I have to be honest, that is a great way to get dopamine, where I look at the sleeve, say, oh, that didn't work, rip it out, and do some new rows and try again. All of that will give me dopamine without poisoning me on corticosteroids. So really, what I'm telling you is the ultimate cure is a thought substitution. Stop using the thoughts that are not only generating dopamine, but generating corticosteroids in your body that poison you because the thoughts are painful and the problems are unsolvable. And in therapy, someone will always say, but I need closure. Seriously, I'm just gonna draw this out of, well, use me. If you're 63 years old and your parents are both dead and you're still mad at them, do you think you're gonna solve that? They're not even there to talk to. Even if they were there, would they even apologize? Would they understand what you're saying? Most of the time, no. This is not solvable this way. You have worked through it as much as you can. Move on to something that makes you happy. Don't use your time in life to obsess about things that aren't solvable and poison you. Meanwhile, thank you. Yo, Netty, yo. Welcome back, Jeanette. Nice to see you. Nice to have you in the crowd. And I think that's actually a welcome, not a welcome back. But I really appreciate your writing in. Meanwhile, for those of you who are interested in Cognitive Fiber Retreat 10, the information link is right under the top of the show notes there, and it will take you to the info thread on Ravelry, and I'm going to say that every week. What is on my hooks and needles? Arg! I really thought I would finish the Love Hex Cardi, but I finished nothing this week. So the stash toss remains at 11 skeins into the stash, versus 26 out. So that's nice, but I certainly need to finish some projects. So meanwhile, the Love Hex Cardi, there's a picture of me standing there, and it looks finished, doesn't it? It's really nice. I added length to the sleeves yesterday, and I really like how it came out, but they are still a bit too wide. In that picture, I thought, well, they look like they're a good length. They're not. Today, I was sitting in a Starbucks, and I started adding ribbing to them, and it was just too short. And I did not want to put this long flap of ribbing on it. My ribbing is already like two inches long. I wanted to add more length and then put the ribbing on it. So I ripped the ribbing out. I was working on the right sleeve, I believe, and I ripped it all out. And I'm going to go back to it and add three more rows in which I will also try to decrease the sleeves a bit. I am using the decrease instructions from the Campfire Cardigan, and you can find that on Ravelry and also on Make and Do Crew where it's free but has too many commercials, so I did download the pattern for, I think their patterns are usually five or six bucks. Well worth it. If you're going to get into making hexagon cardies, and they're a lot of fun if you crochet, and they're very saleable right now, they're kind of a fad. If you want to make these things, it's a, the campfire cardigan is a really good basic pattern to guide you. If you look at mine, you're going to see that I did not follow it that strictly. For one thing, my gauge was much bigger and looser than her gauge, so my sleeves do not have all the extra rows at the edge. Like, she has something like 16 extra rows. I have, I think I'm at 9 there, and I'm probably going to go to 12. Uh, my, my size and my scale came out much different. I think I could have done it and gotten her measurements using DK weight yarn and a smaller hook, to be honest. But the Campfire Cardigan is a good guideline for how are you going to seam it together, 
the pieces, how are you going to add length to the sleeves, etc. I went on my own with the ribbing, which I'm really, really happy about. I love the ribbing on it, really working nicely. So I need to add some more to the sleeves and then do the ribbing around the wrist. The ribbing around the wrist looks like it should take no time at all. The sleeve rows where you're decreasing after you've sewn the pieces together, they go very quickly too. This is a very easy cardigan. I'm working my way through it and I'm kind of designing my own as I go in some ways. And I'm using hints from the pattern of the campfire cardigan. And even so, this is taking me about a month, which leaves me to say, yeah, the poor vestuary vest, I'm just drowning in the stockinette. I'm really, I'm at the point, I'm ready to divide for the armholes, but I'm not giving it my attention because I got so hooked into, pardon the horrible pun, the crocheted love hex cardigan, which is really the campfire cardigan a la Gemma. Meanwhile, I am still plugging along on the fifth CFR 23 sock yarn cow. I finally measured them and realized my finished ones are usually about eight inches. This is currently at four inches, so I thought I was nearly finished. I'm nowhere close, but I am finding all sorts of leftover scrap yarn. And I have to say, I am using up finally all those sock yarn leftovers, and I'm so happy. And I really like these things. They're going into my bin of gifts or things I might try to sell. We'll see. Meanwhile, the stash dive one socks, you've probably been wondering about them. I am on sock number two, and there's a picture there of where I was tonight, which is I am now about an inch and a half, two inches past, about an inch and a half, past the waist yarn for the heel. So that's going along nicely. I'm, you know, three inches and a toe and a heel away from finished. I'd like to sit down and give that some love. The Deep Stash Dive 2 socks. Today I was sort of stuck in my chair working on a, something else, listening to an audiobook, I believe. And I looked at the second sock and said, okay, we were three rows into the ribbing. So I finished the ribbing, which I usually do at 20 rows if I don't have a way to measure it right at hand. And then I put in the first repeat, it's a four row repeat of the pattern, which is the Blueberry Waffle Sock pattern free on Ravelry, but in case you want to know, it goes like this, two rows of stockinette followed by two rows of knit two, purl two. And that's it, and you just repeat it till you get to the place where you want to put in your heel. If you're doing an afterthought, you put in the waist yarn, and then you just do it for, you know, the foot until you get to the toe decreases. Very easy, very pleasant pattern that you kind of impose on your own vanilla sock pattern. So let's see, nothing new in the Dizzy Blondes world. So we could get to a strategy. We are still talking about overthinking. So people constantly say, oh, but I can't stop these thoughts. How do I stop these thoughts? Well, I already talked a bit previously here tonight in this recording about how you can use thought substitution, get a new source of dopamine. However, I would also say you should practice simply pushing away the thoughts. Yeah, that's another way of saying you should meditate. And I've talked about meditation a lot here in past episodes. But I will tell you, basic meditation 101, turn a timer on outside yourself. I say start at one minute. In fact, I'll even do this with you in a session if I'm your therapist. We'll meditate for one minute. All you have to do is focus on your breathing. Or you can focus on a candle flame or a spot on the wall. Or you can focus on repetitive, tedious music like Gregorian chant or Buddhist meditations, chanting, I mean. The idea is you're allowed to think about one thing. And that one thing is usually outside yourself except for breathing. But you can use breathing. Anyway, and you focus on one thing. Every other thought you just push out. Now, here's the important thing. We start at one minute because any thought you have in one minute that you have to push away, you are not going to get harmed because you pushed it away. All right, there's one exception. The house is on fire. Even then, you still got a pretty good chance. But really, no thought you have is so critical that you can't wait one minute to entertain it and to think it through. So here I am and I'm focusing on my breathing. I'm counting to five breaths and then I start my count over and you just do that over and over every time you have another thought 
you push it away and you have to go back to zero and start over. Yeah, when I do this method, I usually get to like three. <laughs> Took me, I can't tell you, 20 years to get the count to five and then start over. Usually, if you stop every time you have an intrusive thought and push that thought out and go back to zero, it's very hard to get to five. Nonetheless, so I'm sitting there and I'm doing that. I'm counting my breaths. You can also just count your breaths. You don't have to do the, you know, start over when you have an outside thought. So I'm counting my breaths or I count up to 20 and I start over, whatever. So I have another thought. So I just say, I can handle this in a minute and I push it away. That's all. I simply don't think about it at all. I just stop it. This is not easy to do. I have been doing this as a practice myself since about 1994. I still have days where I can't focus. All right. Now I do more than a minute. You can increase your time. I will tell you, you will get benefits by increasing your time. However, for me, there's an upper limit of about 10 minutes. The research shows 10 minutes twice a day is all you have to do of this. So what is it I think you're doing? Okay, well, let's go to the dopamine world here for a minute, the physiology world. If you do this, even if you're not succeeding, you will lower your blood pressure and you will slow your heartbeat. So it's a resting state for your body and that's a good thing, particularly if you have problems with heartbeat or blood pressure. So that's just on the surface. If I do this, I'm going to slow myself down and relax my body and slow down my bodily processes in a positive way. But the other thing I'm doing, whether I do it for one minute or five minutes, eight minutes, 10 minutes, I am learning how to control my own thinking. That is, I am in charge of what goes on between my ears. So if I am overthinking, nothing will stop it except me. There is nobody else who can walk in there and stop it for you. So meditation is a way to practice ending overthinking, just cutting it off. The interesting thing now, and I'm not going to go into more about meditation per se, but why only 10 minutes twice a day? There's research on this, but also one of the great American meditators, <laughs> Deepak Chopra, who's a physician in San Diego, teaches all his patients to do this. One of the things Chopra was asked, you know, how long do you have to meditate? He said 10 minutes twice a day. Most of the research I've read about meditation uses that amount. And so that is the kind of clinically indicated amount that we do our research on. But the interesting point there is, now Buddhists may meditate for hours a day, but the point is, yes, that has its own benefits, but for practicing controlling your own thinking, you only need a few minutes a day. It doesn't take a lot. And what happens when you do it? Well, first of all, I do it for one minute with my patients, but I tell them, go home and try it for like three minutes. And your timer has to be outside you, so you don't have to focus on how much time is left. Okay. But all you're doing is practicing. You're practicing controlling your own mind. That's it. Now, there are other benefits to it, sure. It relieves trauma. It slows the heart beat, lowers the blood pressure, all that good stuff. But the reality is, at a very base level, if you're from the West and you're not from a culture that meditates, at a very base level, you're simply learning to control your own thinking. That's all. You have to practice any skill. And controlling overthinking is a skill. And guess what? Everybody has to learn it. Why is that? Well, I'll go back to episode 169 and you can hear me talking about the dopamine addiction that drives that. And also you want to practice this simply because you don't want yourself flooded with corticosteroids. It reduces your risk of heart attack and all those good things. So when we're talking about overthinking, I've already today talked about two different things. One is thought substitution. Instead of this distressing thought, I will substitute in my thinking about my craft work, making a happy plan, remembering a good experience. That's one way. But really what we're talking about today is you can actually just sit down, confront the habit and practice ending it by practicing just pushing away the thoughts. Now, here's the interesting thing there. You're not judging the thoughts. You're not evaluating the thoughts. All you're doing is saying, I can think about this thought, but I won't do it now. I will do it when I am finished meditating. If you're really nervous, Put a pencil and paper next to you and every time you have one of those thoughts you're pushing away, just write it down and then push it away. 
I don't usually recommend that because I think you want to sort of just stay in your relaxed meditative state, but you could do that too. If you practice that, what you'll learn is after you finish meditating, you'll look at what you wrote and say, geez, none of these are that important. Yeah, that's the whole point. One of the things you learn when you meditate is these obsessive things that you're torturing yourself with, they're actually not that important. They really can wait. Now, remember what I always tell you. If I tell you, do not do this thing, you will be programmed to do it. So if I say, you may not think this unhappy thought, you will, of course, get obsessive about not thinking, and you will think about it by not thinking about it and working, you know, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, we never tell people, don't ever do that again, unless it's really a dangerous thing. You know, okay, lying down on the double yellow line on a freeway, don't do that again. But we instead talk about reducing habits, controlling habits, moderating habits. So when I first found out I was diabetic and I had to change my diet radically, what did I do? I said I can still have desserts, but I can only have three bites. And eventually I just lost interest in the desserts. Okay, that's the way it works. You just can say, not forever, not forever. You know, I'm not going to say I will never think this thought. You say, Sure, I can think it, but I can think it when I'm ready to think it. So you're going to take control of your brain. Even in the extreme case of addiction, the leader in that field is Alcoholics Anonymous. And even they do not say you can never drink again. What they say instead is just for today. Don't drink. Every morning you get up and you say just for today. Because if an alcoholic accidentally does drink or kind of loses control of themselves, you can't have them feeling like, well, now that I ruined it, I might as well drink all day because I ruined that whole AA thing of never drinking again. So AA doesn't say that. AA, even in the extreme example of a life-threatening addiction like alcoholism, says just for today. When you're going to practice pushing away the thoughts by meditating, you're just doing it for a few minutes. You can have those thoughts back. They're not lost. So one of the ways to manage overthinking you're going to sit down with a timer outside you, get in a comfortable position, and just for a few minutes, you will focus on only one thing that's neutral, like a candle flame or chanting, something like that, the noise of a train, I used to use that, whatever, something kind of monotonous, and you're just going to focus on one thing, and you're going to push away all the other things. Oh, shoot. Well, now I'm at 25 minutes a day on the bike desk. And I crossed the 170 mile mark a day or two ago. I am really, really happy about this. Today I didn't do it because I went out walking, as I may talk about later. I just was roaming around between Joann's and a Starbucks, but got a nice walk in. But I have been doing this every day, and I realize I'm at 25 minutes now, I think for about 10 days. And I'm starting to get used to it, which is nice, because my goal is to get to 30 minutes a day. And then after that, I'm going to kind of reassess after I've been doing 30 for about a month. I'm going to reassess what I want to be doing with that skill, including do I want to take it outside and do a little running or walking or hiking. But right now, that's been great. I'm very, very happy about that. In the fluffy books, I haven't been watching Alexander the Great. I really do want to catch up with it, but I just finished today. A Murderous Tryst by Lynn Messina. At night to fall asleep, I am listening to earlier books as I fall asleep in the same series. This is the Beatrice Hyde Clare, I think her name is, and I'm deeply enjoying them. These are just fluffy cozies at their best. I think actually they're meant to be Regency cozies, although since she really doesn't talk a lot about the wardrobe, you would never know it. You would only know because of sort of the manners they espouse, and also everybody's in carriages, not cars. But it is a lot of fun. So I just finished A Murderous Tryst. It's a very fun entry in the series, and it's heading to a collision with her other series, which is about Verity Lark, the heroine of the Beatrice series, Beatrice. Her husband is the half-brother of Fairy Lark, and so these things kind of collide. I'm looking forward to that. I think there is a new book in the Beatrice series, the next book coming out that I pre-ordered, and that is where they collide. 
I still have a new book in the Verdi Lark series, A Lark's Conceit. I'm not that fond of Verdi Lark, but I really do like Beatrice Hyde Clare. Well, actually now Beatrice Matlock, Duchess of Kesgrave, I think is what she is. But anyway, I'm enjoying them. An unexpected treat this week was The Scandalous Confessions of Lydia Bennett Witch. I'm midway through it. This is fascinating. There are a lot of people writing fanfic based on Jane Austen, as you probably know. This is one of the most original, interesting, witty, and clever ones I've seen so far. I don't want to give anything away. I did not see this coming. It's very inventive. And it's a very interesting look at Lydia Bennett's character from a whole new perspective. Her side comments on the personalities of her sisters are deeply enjoyable. Something I really like, I just got a multi-page scanner. I'm so happy. You may remember I'm in the digital cleanup here, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But I realized I have a huge amount of paperwork to scan in and digitize. And then I'm just shredding all those puppies. And I finally realized I need a serious scanner that I can have a group of papers in and let it self-feed. And I need a scanner that will take a thumb drive. And we have a very old printer, not very old, but a few years old. And you can use it with Bluetooth to send stuff to your computer, which is a little iffy with my computer. I just really wanted to put stuff on a thumb drive right from the scanner. I didn't want to have to use the Bluetooth or the middleman type of thing. And that one, you have to center each page on the glass of the printer, blah, blah, blah. So I finally broke down the Brother Scanner. I'll let you know how this works. It just came today. I really expected to have more to say about it, but literally it's sitting on my love seat waiting to be assembled and put into use. I am so excited about it. Put a lid on it, the tea tastings. Last week I talked about the apple custard tea and I did not get the ingredients into the show notes until today. So if you look at the show notes for episode 172, you will actually see the ingredients of the apple custard tea. Meanwhile, this week I tried the autumn almond chai herbal. Now again, I don't really believe in an herbal tea as a chai. It doesn't really make a lot of sense to me, but this is a really nice tea. This is pleasant, quite drinkable. I wouldn't go out of my way for it, but if you handed me a cup of it, I would. It, to me, was very strongly almond scented and almond flavored. Just so you know, it's rooibos tea, cinnamon, ginger, cloves, cardamom, orange peel. Now right there, you've got basically the spicing of a chai, so I can see where they're coming from, and then almond essence. So I, I, I liked it a lot. Again, I'm not into nutty teas. The smell of almond in a tea, like chestnut in a tea, any nuts in a tea, hazelnut, just doesn't do a lot for me. So I'm not going to go out and order this specially. But having had it arrive in one of their sample packs, it's been delightful and I quite enjoyed it. It was a nice tea for a morning in early spring here in the mountains. All right, so let me get on to the blather. So, voting. I voted this week, and I did something very new for me, and that is the ISB, the Interactive Sample Ballot. I really like this. I will tell you about it. I sat down on Monday night and really worked my way through everything. It wasn't a long ballot here in Southern California, and I pretty much knew who I wanted. But I went through it online, and I noticed at the official government site for LA County voting, they had the ISB and it's the interactive sample ballot. So you can go on there and you can work your way through the ballot such as it appears when you go to the voting booth and you can make your choices. But where it gets really neat is then you can submit that to the website and it will offer you a QR code and it says, take a picture of this. So I did. So when you go to the ballot box, you walk in, you go to the ballot box, you, know, you register, you show that you're there, and then you, which is very easy by the way, they give us a barcode on the back of our paper sample ballot. So you just take that barcode in. I ripped off the page and took that. So after they check you in with your barcode, you don't need to show other ID. You walk into the voting booth, you know, and it says, okay, you want to vote? And you say, yeah. And it says, if you have an ISB, QR code, just wave it under that scanner over on the right. So I thought, well, that's good. 
So instead of going down the ballot and voting on the computer, I just waved my QR code under the scanner and it immediately printed with a laser printer a ballot and the ballot was completed with my votes. And then you looked at it to make sure it was accurate and then you pushed it back into the scanner and it sucked it in and you would vote it. And that was it. So in other words, all you did was wave your barcode at them and then go to the voting booth, answer one or two questions, and then wave your QR code under the scanner. And then your ballot came out. You, by the way, you could, when you waved your QR code, it would print your ballot on the screen so you could check it. But then also at the bottom of that, it would say, okay, print. It would print it. You could check it again, and then you feed it back. So my voting took all of five minutes. It was really, really wonderful. Next up was the Heroes Journal. You may know I've been working on that since late November. And it was very interesting because I was doing things like I went to the Evolution of Psychotherapy Conference. I got COVID, all sorts of exciting things. Well, in the Heroes Journal for that round, my goal was to get myself biking, starting with 15 minutes a day and increasing five minutes every month. And my other goal was to follow the fad savings program that was going around at that time where you take 100 days and each day you put an amount in your savings. And you, because it's 100 days, the first day you put in $1, second day you put in $2 or so on. But really what you do is when you have extra money, you just figure out, can I put this into the savings account? And you put a different amount in every day. But for 100 days, you put in each day an amount between one and 100. You don't repeat amounts. So one day you put in $1, you don't do that again. Another day you put in $67, you won't do that again. You may put in 66, whatever. All right, if you do this this way and you add up the numbers, one plus two plus three plus four and so on up to 100, you get $5,050. Pretty nice. And I thought, well, this is interesting because our income goes up and down during the month. So I'll give this a try. Okay, I finished the 100 days. Yeah, that's nice. There are my property taxes for next year. Yeah, I'm pretty, well, not completely, but pretty close. So I put those into a high yield seven month CD. So that will cash out. And I already told the CD, put it right in the right bank account. That will cash out in time for me to pay that. So what happened? I did 100 days of the Hero's Journal. I met both my goals. I'm now biking 25 minutes a day. I'm over 170 miles since November, since mid-November. But remember, I had to stop biking for like three weeks because of COVID. I've also got several more thousand dollars in the bank. And the bills are being paid and everything else is running very well. I'm really happy about this. So I restarted Hero's Journal. Now, the one I'm using is the one that's kind of loosely based on Lord of the Rings, really loosely. But it's that same kind of journey from the small town through all the perils and fight the dragon at the end. And I really like it. It was a very fun story. So I decided to redo it because I don't remember the early parts. I wasn't really following it closely and wasn't looking at the journal itself. I was just kind of saying, check the box that you deposited money today, blah, blah, blah. So this time I'm doing it much more attentively and I'm really enjoying it. And I'm also seeing what I wrote on it from the last time I did it. Remember, I'm doing this in a PDF format and I can write on the PDF with my remarkable tablet. So I'm now at a point where I'm seeing what I was entering last time when I wasn't paying a lot of attention to the journal itself. And I really, really like this. So I'm on my second round. Now my current goals, I want to continue the savings plan. I'm doing it again. And I also want to bike. I'm still increasing the biking every month by five minutes. So currently I'm at 25 minutes a day and I'm looking forward to getting to 30 minutes, uh, probably in less than a month. This has been an amazing thing. I added one goal and that is I'm trying to train myself to go to bed at 10 o'clock every night. I usually go to bed at midnight. So right now my rule is I must go to bed by 1145 instead of midnight. I'm just cutting it back 15 minutes. How has that been working? Well, I had about five days of this so far, I think. One day I blew it. I went to bed at like five to midnight, but I started at quarter to midnight. I realized it really was late. 
but I'm now actually going to bed about 10 30 or 11 and I'm sleeping much better I feel much better it's really remarkable I'm not as tired as I was so that goal is well on its way and I already can see some other goals I'm gonna to have to work on meanwhile though I want to recommend the Heroes Journal the PDFs you can buy them in an online version there's three different versions the Galaxy one the Harry Potter type one the magic one and the basic starting one which is very Lord of the Rings they are five dollars each as PDFs if you have an iPad or a Remarkable that you can write on these are just wonderful I cannot recommend it enough I'm having a great time with it it is a great cognitive behavioral and yet fun way to achieve some goals meanwhile I did start writing one of my books I have a lot of books that I've had around for a while and you know in the heyday of this podcast people were always saying you should write a book well I'm always a little bit late but better late than never I just finally realized I have a lot of books swirling in my head and I'm just writing them now when I say writing it's a bit of a misnomer I'm actually dictating them I dictated a chapter I sat down yesterday it took about two hours to crank through it's a brief chapter it's about 15 pages I like it it wasn't at all what I thought it would be I'm really really enjoying it and I'm trying to find a way to talk about crafting that you probably haven't heard before and it's not cognitive behavioral in quite the way you might think it's a lot of fun we'll see how it goes if I can keep this going I will tell you what the book is about in fact I'll probably try to sell it to you I imagine I will self-publish on Amazon and then there was the digital cleaning well the major backup is done I thought it would take days it took weeks I have cleaned everything off the cloud that I have a cloud relating to the iOS system and I have the OneDrive in the MS world cleaned those up deleted stuff then went on to cleaning all the phones and the i stuff the tablets that was pretty straightforward then went on to cleaning my laptop that took a lot of time and then I got my two drives both of which are 4Ts and I I did this all onto one drive and then I spent yesterday with the second drive plugged into the first drive and carried everything across so that second drive is now ready to go to somewhere off the premises so I don't have to worry about it if there's ever a fire in other words I want my backup backed up we're not done I found while I was working on the shredding project I found family records that I want to keep and so I want to now digitize these they're on paper and add them to this set of hard drives so we are finished the major backing up in the digital cleaning but now I'm looking at all this paperwork including the family records and saying I want to scan them in this led to me buying the brother scanner that I hope I will talk about at more length next week what I really want to get across to you a very famous psychologist whose wife was tragically killed last year told us the one thing he learned in the midst of his deep grief is that you must leave your passwords behind for your loved ones and that really moved me and I thought yeah you know in fact you really need to lighten your load get rid of your records your paperwork digitize it all put it in a safe place or in my case one safe place in the house one safe place in a bank's safe deposit box system but you need to do this because you need to help your family and you also need to lighten the load clean up your clutter get rid of all your paper records okay so meanwhile I'm still doing the daily house projects I am still working on cutting two and a half inch strips from my leftover fabrics I do 15 minutes a day I cannot believe how much of this I have I now have enough strips to fill an 18 uh, what is an 18 quart rolling storage unit and that's overflowing so I'm now going into a slightly bigger unit I don't remember how many how big it is but anyway I've got a huge amount of these things and it's really fun because I suddenly am seeing them as light strips versus dark strips and you know what that means log cabin quilts so I'm really kind of excited because I can tell already that I will be working on quilting from the strips I will make pillows I will make quilt tops I will make whatever I need to make curtains whatever it's very very exciting and this stuff is just there but also it's like meeting old friends because now I finished all the fabric left over from the skirt projects 
that I was making and now I'm making strips from the fabrics I had stuffed into my sewing box from 30 years ago. It is so bizarre. They are bright and clean and pretty. They don't look 30 years old. Wow. Meanwhile, the walkway in the front yard, I am still pegging it in. We have about, I think, 20 pegs left to go. And then I still have 11 solar lights that need to go in and around. I'm waiting till my son can work with me on that. The garage camera has not gone up. It's a ring camera because our front door ring went down. So I've been in the process of repairing the ring cameras this weekend. The pup date, Captain and Queenie are doing just fine. The hub state, uh, he blew a tire, then he needed all his tires replaced. Uh, now he needs his battery replaced. Uh, but we're getting there. Until this happens, we are a one car family, which has been interfering with my life a lot. However, we're all doing okay. When I get my car back, Captain will get her annual shots at the vet who are getting a little frantic. Green fingers, I am still just mulching with old tea leaves out there. Underneath all this, you will find in the show notes the community resources, that is a list of the books I've used, knitting and crocheting, and they're all on the Ravelry Group for Cognitive. There's also a link to my favorite resources for things that I buy that support my crafting hobbies. And there's a link to the skills and techniques that I've been using. So those are just general resources you can go visit over on the Cognitive Group on Ravelry, but there are links in the show notes. On the calendar, this Saturday, I believe, is Yarnopoly. It's coming, I if it's, this, it's the 17th, so that's a Sunday. Saturday, second Saturday Stitchers met, I believe, yesterday. But they are still there. You can find them on Facebook if you want to knit or crochet, mostly crochet with them. I've seen also people diamond painting and everything else there. So it's funny because they're just formed around the current fad for crochet. But there's a lot of knitters in there too. So you can go meet with them if you're here in the Santa Clarita region. And of course, at the Joanne Darcy Library in Canyon Country, there is the Sit and Stitch group, usually on the second and fourth Saturday of the month from 9 to noon. CFR 10, that is the Cognitive Fiber Retreat 10, as previously mentioned in this podcast. That will be at the Courtyard by Marriott in Valencia on September 28, 2024. And there's yet another link to that information thread. Romeo, right now, it's looking like it's going to be December 21st to December, I think, 29th. And then I'll be working the 30th and 31st and have off New Year's Day. Such is life. Finally, Minerva gets the last word. And this is about the Worcester, that is Worcester, Massachusetts, the Worcester Public Library campaign called March Meowness, where if the patrons of the library show a picture of their cat, their library fees are forgiven. However, it's even better than that. You can go to their page on Facebook or you can email them and I give you the link in the show notes. I also give you the link to their website where they have the picture that's in the show notes. You can send them a picture of your cat and that's a donation. They will use that to forgive one of their people who owes them money but doesn't have a cat to get a picture of. So. Minerva's picture, of course, was put on their Facebook page, the picture that's in the show notes. And Minerva's last word is she would like you to take a picture of your cat and donate it on the Facebook page for the Worcester Public Library. You can see the spelling in the show notes, by the way. Or you can email it to that address. And if you give them a picture of your cat and you're not in the Worcester region and you're not a member of this library, some other patron of the library gets off free from their fines. What a deal. So Minerva says, let's see some community spirit here. Show all your cats on their Facebook page. And you too can help somebody return their books and renew their card without grief and shame. Having ended on Minerva's community spirit, let me remind you that, of course, when we serve the community, we are serving ourselves. That being individualistic is not as successful as being communal, guys. I know a ton of research that proves this, but either way, let's work for our communities and the whole world is better. Having said that, I'm going to say, everybody, please stay safe, take care of each other, and I will talk to you soon. Bye-bye. So we have come to the end of another episode of Cognitive. Please do not use this podcast to diagnose yourself. If you think you are having a mental health problem, 
please contact a licensed mental health professional. Show notes for these episodes can be found at cognitivepodcast, all one word, dot blogspot.com. Episodes can be found at iTunes under the name Cognitive Podcast, but also can be found posted next to the show notes on the Blogspot page. Thank you so much for listening. Everybody stay safe, take care of each other, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.